You know, the first model airplane that I received for a birthday present, uh, I tried to put it together, and I'm not very gifted at doing this. My son Delaney can put anything together and take it apart again, but God did not gift me in such a manner. And so I had this thing on the table. Uh, the glue was coming apart. All the pieces were in the wrong places. The decals were crooked. And my father walked along while I was trying to do this, and he said, son, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm trying to put this model airplane together that I got for my birthday. He said, well, son, it looks more like a helicopter. And I said, well, help me. What am I to do? He said, you're in such disarray. The best thing you can do is just wipe the slate clean and begin again. Start all over because you cannot get there from where you are right now. We know the definition of insanity to be doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Probably the most known definition of any word but the least practice because we seem intent on doing exactly what we know we shouldn't. I believe this coronavirus, as bad as it really is, you never want any loss of life. If you have a heart for humanity, you're hurting during this time. But God is able to take something that is meant for evil and use it for so much good, and that's what we're witnessing now. The best thing that we can do during this season is to take a look at the way we've been living our lives Think about it. We've had to stop. We've had to take a pause. We can't do the things that we've been ordinarily doing. So what a great opportunity that God gives us in the here and now to take a look at the way we've been living our lives and make the changes that we need to make to start over. If you go back after this coronavirus, after this isolation is over and you start living your life the same way, expecting a different result than you had before the virus came, that's insanity. And if you're honest with yourself, your life, to a great degree, is in disarray. The pieces aren't where they ought to be. It looks totally different from what you really want to achieve with your life. Most of us spend our days rushing around from here to there, from here to there, then we fall in bed at night totally exhausted, having accomplished little or nothing. So what is the answer to that? And part of the reason we fall into bed exhausted is because we've allowed the world system, the order that you and I live, to dictate the manner in which we live our lives. But think about it just for a moment. Under whose influence does the Bible tell us this world order or pattern exists? The Bible tells us in 1 John 5, 19 that we know we are the children of God, but the whole world lies under the control or the sway of the evil one. What does that mean? It means this order, the way we are ordering our lives, it's dictated to us. We are following a flow that leads not to life, but leads to frustration. In fact, Jesus told the disciples in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. So if you want to live again, this is a perfect opportunity to step out of the rhythm and the flow that you've been in for so long that's indicative of the world system that is governed, that is ruled by one that is trying to destroy you. So make sure that you don't miss the opportunity to make some changes, to get out of these rhythms, and to start living your life in a way that is extraordinary. A good example of what I'm, I'm trying to communicate here is that uh, a few years ago, my family, including my mother and father-in-law, went to Massanut in Virginia. We were going to go there on a vacation holiday. We got to walk through the home of Thomas Jefferson, and uh, we got to go tubing down the Shenandoah River. Now, we were looking forward to this event. We had Delaney and Sion with us as well. And so we get in these tubes, and we're going to flow down this river. The, the, the unfortunate reality was, though, that there had been a lack of rain during the rainy season. So there was only about a foot of water in this river, and it wasn't really free-flowing. When we got in the tubes, the tubes themselves almost scraped the bottom of the river. We were told that at the end of this journey, that there would be a beautiful waterfall, that we could slide down a little bit of white water rafting. But Sian and I, which were in the who were in the same tube, learned very quickly that if you didn't stroke your arms, you would just sit still and drift over to the side of the river. And somehow, since there had been no rain, all the animal dung had been collected at the sides of the river. So if you don't flap your arms and try to paddle down the stream, you would automatically drift into this manure, this dung, and it was a horrible, atrocious experience. And most people were having that exact experience. 
Sion and I decided we weren't going to have any of that, so we just started paddling our arms as fast as we could. We got down, and after about two hours of rigorous physical activity, we experienced about 30 seconds of whitewater rafting. What is the point of the story? The point is, if you want to get somewhere, you're going you're gonna to have to give some effort. You won't just evolve or drift in to a desired goal or objective. And if your goal and objective is to live an extraordinary life, to get out of this rut that you've been in pre-coronavirus, to make changes in your life so that you can actually feel that something good is happening, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to make effort. You won't drift into it. A few uh, months ago, a young lady in tears came to me and said, this is not working, Pastor Jeff. I said, what is not working? She said, life. I'm not accomplishing anything. I'm not improving in any areas of my life that really matter to me. I'm overcome by the tyranny of the urgent. That's a, a phrase that was coined by Dawson Troutman of the Navigator, so I, I knew immediately she was well read. She said, but my life is just spinning around. I'm not a better mother. I'm not a better wife. My career's going nowhere. And worst of all, there's really no progress in my spiritual life, in my walk with Jesus. My knowledge of Scripture, my knowledge of God, my spiritual growth is experiencing an incredible stagnation. I find that I'm gossiping, that I'm angry, that I am self-centered, that peace and joy are only peripheral. I just have small, short moments, but overarching, overwhelming in my life is this sense of frustration and discontent. Now, we're in a new series. It's called Reset. And I'm going to introduce you to some people who came to a crossroads in their lives and they said, you know what, I can't keep living the way that I'm living. This frustration, this discontent, this going everywhere here and there and accomplishing nothing, especially not the ultimate goal of my life. And they had an experience with God and they made changes. And these changes are gold to us because in reading the narrative or the story in Scripture, we can glean these principles that we can put into our lives that then will change us from mediocrity to extraordinary living. So when I think about all the characters and narratives we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, I'll get excited and I just want to skip ahead. But let's pause and begin with perhaps the most influential person of the first 300 years of Greco-Roman history, the Apostle Paul, a Roman citizen, a Hebrew by birth, educated in a Greek city. And in Philippians 3, he comes to his own crossroads. He realizes, here's my goal, this is where I want to get to, here's where I am, but the things I'm doing, they're not working. They're not going to achieve the goal. I'm in the middle of insanity. I'm doing the same thing over and over, thinking I'll get a different result. It's not working. Now, the Apostle Paul's goal was to reach God. He had a tremendous passion, an overwhelming passion to meet and to know God and to be accepted before God. Unfortunately, the path he had chosen was one of religion. He truly believed if he could just be good, if he could keep all the righteous ritual laws, that somehow that would qualify him for acceptance and appreciation and significance before the God of the universe. But then he comes to the end of himself and he says, you know, it's not working because I can never be good enough. There's never enough righteous credentials to put me in good standing with God. In Philippians 3, the text we're going to be concentrating on he actually lists his credentials. He says in verse 5 of chapter 3 of Philippians, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Man, I did what all good Jewish boys do. I'm of the people of Israel. I'm of the people of God, his chosen ones. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, when the Israelites would go out to war, the Benjamites would lead them. And everyone would say, after thee, O Benjamin. So the apostle Paul said, I even led us out in conquest. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews which meant that even though we've been dispersed, I've always kept the culture and language of the Hebrew people. He says, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, I am super good. I have reams and reams of paper describing the kind of religious activities I should do, and I do them all. He said, I am so zealous for God that I persecuted the church. When someone came along and told me that what I was doing was wrong and presented the antithesis of what I believed to be right, as far as our approach to God, he said, I decided to persecute them, to close their mouths, to silence them. 
And then he said, as far as righteousness is based on the law, I am faultless. So he comes to the conclusion that I've got all these uh, recommendations or all of these things, all these attributes rather, that are part of my life, and yet I'm doing all these things and being all these things, and it's not working. I'm not good enough. The standard is too high. And the more I get or to know God, the more I realize I need something else. I need something outside of myself. In fact, he says in Romans chapter 7, I don't even keep the moral law that I know and agree that is good. My passion, he says, to do the right thing has very little to do with other desires that stir within my heart and being. And in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, he says, for I have a desire to do what is good. I cannot carry it out, though. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. Paul says, I, I've got to try something else. I've got to push the reset button. This is not working. I have to start over. I cannot get there from here. Now, let me just pause for a second. Paul is an older man, and that's why I find it amazing that he's willing to reset his life. The older you get, the less willing you are to take risks, even if, those, if the current pattern of living is destructive or disintegrating. There's a saying that says, better the devil I know than the devil I don't know. My life is tough, but I don't want it to get tougher. At least I know how to deal with this toughness. At least that's what we convince ourselves. You know, during this coronavirus and our isolation, a lot of us have begun to just pass the time by reading or exercising. I've done both. And although I spend a lot of my time in front of a camera right now, I like to go home and to just get the exercise bike or the machine and hit it hard. And I've been riding my bike back and forth. And some will say, Pastor Jeff, are you sure that's wise given the fact of your history on a bike? So the other day I rode my bike all the way from Upland where I live to our campus at San Dimas. And I was pretty pleased with myself when I learned it was about 15 or 16 miles. And I had done it in around an hour, an hour and five minutes. And I thought, wow, I'm not as out of shape as I thought I was. And then a couple of days later, I decided, well, since my bike is here at the office, I'll just tell my wife that I'll ride it home. No need to come and collect me. I'll ride my bike. And I rode my bike from the San Dimas campus all the way back to Upland. And I realized about halfway in the journey that from Upland to the San Dimas campus, it's all downhill. And from the San Dimas campus to Upland, it's all uphill. Folks, I got to tell you, it took me about two hours and 10 minutes to make that journey, and it took me about three or four days to recover from it. You notice as you get older, things don't work the way that they used to, and you're afraid to take risks for fear you might do some harm to yourself. But if that's the way you're going to live, and if you think that you can live the same way and overcome the frustration and the disappointment, it will never change. That's why I love one of my favorite quotes comes from Eileen Gruder. And she says, you can live on bland food so as to avoid an ulcer, drink no tea, coffee, or other stimulants, go to bed early, stay away from nightlife, avoid all controversial subjects so as to never give an offense, mind your own business, avoid involvement in other people's problems, Spend money only on necessities and save all you can. And she finishes by saying, and you can still break your neck in the bathtub and it'll serve you right. How true is that? How true? Yeah, you can play it safe, but you'll just have a life of mediocrity. And something still in the end will get you and you would have lived your life achieving no great thing. The Apostle Paul says, I've got to reset my life. I've got to start again, and it's going to require some risk because what I really need is a Savior. I need somebody to rescue me. And in Romans chapter 7, he says, What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of sin and death? And he says, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Apostle Paul pushed the reset button and realized that there was someone who would save him from the law. The law is good, but it can never save you. It only tells you that your face is dirty. It can't clean you up. He needs outside help, an outside agent. And then in Romans 1, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone. He's saying there is a way to reach God, and it's not through efforts, not through religion. It's through the receiving, the acceptance of what Jesus the Son of God, the gift He offers you is He takes your sins on the cross, past, present, future, forgives you, and gives you the right to come in to the presence of God, 
Now, we can talk a lot more about that, but let's look at his example. Paul realized what he was doing was not working. He was drifting. There was no peace in his life. He wasn't accomplishing the goal, so he changed gears, and he decided to head in a different direction. Now, as the greatest influencer of the first three centuries, as the Apostle Paul opens the window of his life and lets us look in, we notice he gives us a roadmap how to reset our lives. That's what this series is about. And we begin by understanding that we are called to live an extraordinary, not a mediocre life, that we're supposed to live a life of deep satisfaction, not frustration. And so here's what we're going to do quickly in the time we have left. We're going to look at that roadmap. We're going to ask three questions, give three answers that leads to three or lead to three agents of change. So how can I then change course? How can I reset and reset in a way that's going to lead to an extraordinary life, to a sense of peace and satisfaction and joy? It's beautiful. First question, what is the goal toward which you are working? You look at your life and you think, well, I'm here. I want to be there, but I'm not getting there. Well, the first question is, where's the there that you're trying to get to? What are you chasing? Not what you think it should be. Be honest. What is truly the objective of your life? What are you pursuing? What are you after? Now, again, what I'm going to give you may sound super spiritual, but I promise you this is about the most practical message that I've ever delivered. Please listen. What is the goal of your life? What are you after? Most of us want a good marriage, a successful workplace, financial security, peace, joy, a stable family, good friends, good times with those friends, accomplishments, health and vitality. Those are the things we want. But folks, those are actually byproducts of a greater achievement. There is a greater goal when achieved, these things then become present realities. Unfortunately, what most of us end up doing is chasing the byproducts instead of the core reality that produces them. I often tell the story of playing Monopoly with my grandmother. She was ruthless. I won't tell you the complete story, but uh, she would invite me over to her house on the weekends. I was probably in my young teens, and she would thrash me in the game of Monopoly. She was very good at it. It was only a matter of time before she owned everything, including the bank. And I got tired of losing, so years go by I'm through high school. Then I go off to Bible college and seminary, and I learn while I'm at Bible college, while I'm at Johnson University, I had a roommate who was very good at Monopoly, and I learned how to play. And I couldn't wait to get back to my grandmother's house to just destroy her in one game of Monopoly. And I did. I came over. I said, hey, I'm back from college. Just wanted to visit. How about a game of Monopoly? And we played. And I beat my grandmother so badly. I mean, I owned it all. And I was laughing the whole way through. I owned all the little red houses and the green houses. I owned the bank. I had all the money. She asked for grace. I gave her none. And I just celebrated at the end of the game as I had defeated grandma. No mercy. And quickly she took the board, folded it up, and she put it back in the box. And she said, oh, well, everything just goes back into the box. The cars, the houses, the money, everything. I've never forgotten that. I wanted to take that Monopoly board and put it on the wall as a memorial to my victory. That every time I walked in her house, she would be reminded that there was a time and place where young Jeffrey, her grandson, destroyed her in a game of Monopoly. The problem is that game, while it's just a game, is perhaps one of the best metaphors of life. See, if you're after everything and you're pursuing all these things, the houses, the cars, the money, everything, it all goes back in the box. And if that's what you're pursuing, if you go after that, the Bible tells us in Matthew 16, for what profit is it a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Now, if you look at that, there's another option. What is implied in the text? If you gain the world, lose your soul. But if you gain your soul, there's a possibility you could gain the world, which means the soul then should be your ultimate pursuit. Now stay with me just a moment. We're taking some pieces and putting them into the game here, and it'll all come out in the end, but please stay with me. 
I dug deep into my archives for this illustration. I've used it a few times. It's a classic. It's ancient from Myra Brooks Welch. Here's how it goes. It's a classic poem, but listen carefully to the words. She says, "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it hardly worth his while to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good people, he cried. Who starts the bidding for me? One dollar, one dollar, do I hear two? Two dollars, who makes it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three. But no, far from the back of the room, a gray-bearded man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust off that old violin and tightening up its strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angels sing. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, What now am I bid for this old violin? And he held it up with the bow. One thousand, one thousand do I hear two, two thousand, who makes it three, three thousand once, three thousand twice, going and gone, said he. The audience cheered, but some of them cried, we just don't understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune, all battered and bruised with hardship, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going, he's almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. What is the point? The point is a job is just a job. A career is just a career. A marriage is just a marriage. A family, a family, a pursuit, just a pursuit. A violin is just a violin until God picks it up and the touch of the master's hand. Do you see where this is going? C.S. Lewis said it's like this. Aim at heaven and you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you get neither. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. So when you push the reset button, the first thing you have to do, don't you think it would be better to step out of the flow that is governed by the prince of the power of the air? Go against the grain. Go upstream. Don't do the same thing everybody else is doing or you're going to get the same thing everybody else is getting. Stress and frustration and chronic discontent. But instead, C.S. Lewis said, remember, aim at heaven and you get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you get neither. So then, the very first question, what is the goal of your life? There's only one answer that will be effective, and it's Jesus. When you get Jesus, you get everything else thrown in. C.S. Lewis had an incredibly sharp intellect. He was an atheist that came to the end of his life, the end of himself, rather, and turned and gave his heart over to Jesus. And in one of his works describing his conversion, he says, You must picture me alone in that room, not after night, wanting that burden in my mind to be lifted even for a second. The steady, unrelenting approach of he whom I earnestly desired not to meet, that which I had greatly feared, had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, he says, I finally came in and admitted that God was God, and I knelt and I prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. That was the last line in the last paragraph on which he records his conversion moment. And then the first line of the next page and next chapter reads this. I thought I was coming to a place. I found out I had come to a person. When you come to religion, you come to a place. When you come to Christ, you come to a person. And the best news about that revelation is this. He's always watching you. Always. Every single moment. And when you realize that is not a threat, but a promise, everything changes. Which is why the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, 7, Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. What a time to push the reset button and to say, there should be to know Christ, to meet Him, to come close to God. 
Because as I achieve that goal, everything else will be added unto me. What is the goal of your life? Jesus. Two, how can I achieve the goal? As you push the reset button to aim at heaven and get earth thrown in, the second thing you need to do is press into the goal. The Apostle Paul says this, once his goal changed, once it became Christ, he said, not that I have already attained it, but I press on. I love that word. Press on. Imagine a runner stretching for the tape after the 100-meter sprint, and his arms are flailing and his face is contorting as he reaches for the finish line. Every muscle is focused on one ultimate objective. Now stay with me. When I talk about this passage, I always mention a friend of mine, Keith Turner. We played basketball together in high school. And some of you may find this humorous, but Keith Turner actually wanted to be the first Elizabethan cyclone to dunk a basketball in a high school basketball game. Now, the game has evolved a lot in the last 30, 40 years, so you go to a high school game, a good high school game, you're going to see a number of dunks. But back in the 70s and 80s, they were rare, but Keith Turner decided he was going to be the first one at our school in a game. A lot of us could do it in practice, but in a game, in traffic. He started putting a white piece of athletic tape on the backboard, and every day after practice, beginning with his freshman year, he would do the weights and do a thing called the jumper where you would build your thighs and your jumping muscles, supposedly. I think it broke your back more than it built your muscles, but he was convinced. And he would jump and touch this piece of athletic tape on the backboard. And when he could do it 10 times in a row, he would raise the mark just a little bit. And then after he could do that 10 times, he would raise the mark a little more. He did that over the course of three and a half years so that by the time the end of his junior year, that piece of tape was on the top of the square. Now, a lot of other things were brought to bear, but that was his activity and he never gave up. And then his junior year, my senior year, we were playing Sullivan Central in a regional final and I got the rebound and I did what coach told me to do. I pivoted to the outside and I gave him a, a power pass to midcourt where he was waiting. And he turned and he dribbled five big dribbles, leapt somewhere around just inside the free throw line and with two hands shattered the backboard because this was before breakaway rims. It was so thunderous that the other team even celebrated what they had just seen. And most of us just cried because we knew and understood the mark that he had established and the work that it had taken to achieve what he had just achieved. See, that's the thing. You don't just drift into this. Your primary objective is to know Christ, to pursue heaven and earth gets thrown in. But to do so means that you're going to have to set the mark higher and higher and never give up. Mother Teresa, another one of my favorite quotes, toward the end of her life, she says this, May I truly obey you starting today to be a courier of your love, your grace to a hurting world because up to now, I've really done nothing. Wow, up to now, I've done nothing? This is the Mother Teresa who had won the Nobel Peace Prize, who had made great strides in mercy and compassion, helping the poorest of the poor in the streets of Calcutta. And she gets to the end of her life and she says this, may I start doing good things now because up to now I've done nothing? But this is what people who live extraordinary lives do. Every new day, they have a fresh desire in their hearts, a never-ending compassion, an all-consuming objective to press into their pursuit and to raise the bar just a little higher every day. Most of you are aware that my dear friend, Dr. Ravi Zacharias, passed away this week. It has been a hard journey for someone who's influenced you, for a mentor to fade away. So I've been doing a lot of radio interviews this week. In fact, I've got a few more today. People are asking me, what was it like to be a friend of Ravi's? Or what was it like the first time you met Ravi? And they, they want to know, please tell us. Ravi's gone, but we know that you were close. Tell us about Ravi. I remember the first time I met him. It was in 1999 in the offices of RZIM in Atlanta, Georgia, and I walked in and I spent about two and a half hours with Ravi and almost immediately you knew there was something different. 
I've been in meetings with pastors before, large gatherings and small gatherings. And I've noticed that we pastors are just like everybody else. There's a certain pecking order that everybody looks to when we come together. We have the feelings of insignificance just like the rest of the world. We struggle just like the rest of the world. We have our good days and bad days. But not Ravi. Ravi makes you feel like you're the only person in the world. There is something that just glows. He reflects the love, the mercy, the depth of God. And finally, on our third or fourth meeting, I asked him a question and I said, Ravi, you just seem to be so different. In fact, the conversation with Ravi never disintegrates into something that is off color or should not be discussed. He always seems to maintain the high road. And I asked him, as a young pastor, i got to ask you, how have you achieved what you've achieved in your life? How is it that you just shine with the glory of God? How is it that you've been able to maintain this incredible character and integrity? And he looked at me and he said this, Jeff, one passage from the Old Testament, one passage from the New Testament, every morning, and then I walk and contemplate what I have read and ask the Spirit of the living God to speak to me and guide me that day. I thought it was going to be something so profound, but it's something so small. And then I began to realize the older I got, if you try to be humble, you won't be. If you try to be forgiving, it's too hard. If you try to be patient, if you try to have self-control, if you try to be merciful, that's not how these things happen. They are the natural byproducts of something else. As you commune with God daily, one day suddenly you wake up in your 30s or 40s and you realize you're humble. You're forgiving, you're patient, you're merciful. Not because you're trying to be, because that's who you have become. I thought of the African proverb, little by little makes a bundle. As you stack piles of wood, as you stack the knowledge and wisdom of God into your life, one day you become. The goal is reached. You know him. He knows you. You see, the question is, how are we going to get from here to there when the ultimate loftiest goal is to know Christ and to experience his power so that everything about our life changes. You've got to get out of the flow. You've got to change your goal. You've got to press into it then with daily habits. And the Bible says, then and only then will all these things be added unto you. Listen, this is not rocket science. The person who begins each day with devotion and prayer, who talks to God throughout the day, who listens to worship music in their car or at home to impact the senses and the emotions, who becomes aware of the presence of God in every circumstance in any given day, that is the person who gets earth thrown in. And if you press into those things, here's what will happen. You will find the touch of the master's hand. Why? And then a mediocre life will be transformed into an extraordinary life because, listen carefully now to these next two statements, with the calling of God comes the power of God to assist those who are living in obedience to Christ. Let me say it again. With the calling of God comes the power of God to assist those who are living in obedience to Christ. You are obeying Christ. You have the knowledge and the wisdom of Christ. God releases that power for extraordinary living. Second, with the knowledge of God comes the wisdom of God to achieve ultimate victories. So as you sit in the presence of God, you gain the wisdom of God, and then you make right decisions at the right time in the right place that leads to a victorious life. And it happens through relationship. I've got a good friend. His name is Mike. He's, a, he's an incredible entrepreneur. He's very good at leadership, and he's very good at it because it is Christ-centered. He models the leadership lessons that Jesus gives us. He applies those into his life. It's how he leads his life, his family, and his business. He's a very wealthy man, although he did not pursue wealth. He pursued Christ and made business decisions based on Scripture. Now, I like to hang out with Mike because I want to be a better leader. And I notice as I hang out with him, I gain wisdom and guidance. Sometimes it's just one phrase that he'll make. He thinks I don't hear it because I'm so ADD, but I hear it and I'm listening to it all the way home. 
How do I apply this? See, that's why the Apostle Paul said, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press into it. I press on. He says, I press into Jesus and Jesus presses into me. So what is the goal of your life? And how can I achieve the goal? The goal is Jesus. And how do you achieve it? You press into him through the daily habits of your life. And third and finally, but Jeff, what if I fail? Because I've tried this game before. And the answer is simple. Make sure that you fail forward. Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I want to promise you something. If you rearrange and reset your life to pursue the ultimate goal of Christ, if you do that, I promise you, you will have failures. You say, well, why? I cannot tell you how many times my friend Keith Turner raised the mark on the backboard and failed. Week after week after week to the point I would see him dejected, but he never gave up. He knew that if he just stayed with it, the time will come when he will reach the next level. Can I ask you something? How many times have you started your devotional life? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what Pastor Jeff says. Two weeks later, it's gone. How many times have you prioritized godly things? How many times have you intended to get your house in order? Have you committed to live a holy life? How many times have you promised God you're not going to do that thing that you know you shouldn't be doing anymore? Only a couple of days later, here we go again. How many times have you made a promise with great intentions that you are going to pursue God more than anything else? How many times? Do you know why you failed? Part of the reason is that Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, your enemy is pretty powerful. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world. Your enemy is powerful. Well, what do I do then? What's the secret, Pastor Jeff? Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. That means he failed too. The sin is not in the failure. You're in the flesh. Your enemy is powerful. You're going to have setbacks. And they're usually going to happen primarily through distractions of lesser loves. There are going to be times in your life you get distracted by an affluent world system who offers other things to you. Failure will come. But you can decide whether you fail backward or forward. I don't know if you know who Jonas Salk is, but he discovered the polio vaccine. Uh, but he failed over 200 times on his way to his discovery. And a reporter once asked him, Mr. Salk, how did it feel to fail 200 times? Salk's response was this, I never failed 200 times in anything in my life. In my family, we were taught not to use the word fail. I just discovered 200 ways how not to invent a vaccine for polio. Somebody once asked Winston Churchill, what most prepared you to lead Great Britain all alone for a while against Nazi Germany? Churchill's response was, well, there was a time that I had to repeat a grade in the English equivalent of elementary school. The reporter quickly fired back, you mean you failed a grade in elementary school? Churchill's response, I never failed anything in my life. I was given a second opportunity to get it right. So if it took Jonas Salk 200 times to come up with the vaccination for polio, was Jonas Salk a failure? Churchill flunked a grade in elementary school. Was Winston Churchill a failure? The Chicago Cubs, how many years between their World Series? 108. Were they a failure? Yes, but that's a bad example. You know the point. The sin is not in the failure. The sin is giving up. When apathy sets in, when you forget, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you forget, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So this is our opportunity, folks. We're on this great journey. Reset, reset. Don't keep doing the same things expecting a different result. Make a decision now. You've had the wrong goal. And that's why you're frustrated. And that's why you're falling into bed at night totally frustrated, weary, tired, and accomplishing nothing. Change the goal. Aim for heaven and get earth thrown in. Press into the goal by your daily habits, by your devotional life, by walking and talking with God, by worship music, by setting your mind on the higher things. And whatever you do, make sure you fail forward so that all these things will be added to you. Start well, but finish even better. Now, one last thing. 
while you're resetting, you got to remember something. Now focus in here. I know you're at home or you may be watching uh, online. Uh, in fact, most of you are listening in Australia, New Zealand, in London, wherever, some of the islands. Please take a deep breath right now and listen to what I'm about to say. There is a calling on your life that most of us will never achieve. Oh, Pastor Jeff, why do you have to be the bearer of such bad news? Because I'm trying desperately to wake you up. You're missing out. And the reason we will not achieve that high calling that gives us the ultimate sense of accomplishment and satisfaction and significance is because we will refuse to seek first the kingdom of God. And as a result, the power and the wisdom of God needed to experience the quantum leap never comes. Mediocrity is much like a pandemic. When you're living it, there seems to be no end in sight, but very few people are willing to do what is required to achieve that greatness. You know, as I said earlier, just stay with me. Ravi Zacharias is with Jesus now, and I will forever be grateful. His life may have ended, but his influence will go on forever. His words will echo through the halls of eternity. Can I tell you something about Dr. Zacharias? I have met a lot of leaders in my lifetime. I have never met a man with a greater intellect and at the same time a pastoral heart. I've met intelligent, educated men, but not with the pastoral heart that Dr. Zacharias maintained throughout the course of his life. Can I tell you something? When you met, if you would have met Dr. Ravi Zacharias, you would have realized he could have used that intellect to gain the world. If he hadn't been a Christian, he would be even more well-known. He would have gained stored up resources, all the houses, all the cars, everything. That's the kind of man he was. But he decided instead to give the gift that he had received back to the giver. And God, as a result, injected him with the Spirit of God, put an anointing on his life, and Ravi Zacharias changed the world. But don't you realize the same calling is on your life? And that if you would give what God has given to you back to the Father and would pursue Him above and beyond anything else, through the daily habits of your life, and even through failures, never giving up, do you realize there's greatness in you? Don't you realize there's a slam dunk in every single Christ follower? I think somehow we've forgotten the transformative power of Jesus. Ravi Zacharias once told me about an experience he had while he was in Iraq. He had met a man in Iraq who had been totally changed, transformed by the grace and the power of Jesus Christ. Before he was a Christ follower, he was actually an assassin, a hired gun who for money would murder people who stood in the way of empires. Well known, until one day he walked in a hotel room, broke open the door, and killed a man. And just a moment after, a little four-year-old boy that the killer had not seen came out from under the covers, saw what had happened, and said to the hired killer, where's my daddy? Where's my daddy? The hard killer didn't know what to do, how to respond. So he looked at the boy and he said, well, your dad has gone to paradise. And the little boy got out of bed, walked over to the hired gun, grabbed his hand and looked up into his eyes and said, sir, would you take me to paradise too? The hard killer said he went out onto a trash heap and just sat there for hours weeping and crying as he had discovered the man he had become. And he talks about that he started having a dream. And the dream, he said, was Jesus coming to him and saying to him, you've been called to a purpose far greater than this one. And after months and months of the dream, he actually bent his knee, gave his life to Christ, and now works for Samaritan's Purse all throughout the Eastern world. Now you think about this for a minute. A hired killer, a killer becomes a healer. One who took life now gives life to address the most incurable disease. 
And I'm just thinking if God can do that with a hired gun, what on earth could he do with you? If you would seek first the kingdom of God, think about all these things are added unto you. D.L. Moody said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. And he said, by God's help, I am to be that man. This is the gift of reset. You can do it. Don't go back to the old way when we go out of isolation. Running here and there and falling into bed, totally tired and weary, not sure what you've accomplished. Start again. Push the reset button. And as we look at these characters in the weeks to come, learn, glean from them. This is the Word of God. And this mediocre life that you're in can become extraordinary. When you change your ultimate goal, you experience the byproducts. Pursue heaven, get earth thrown in. Press into the goal with daily habits. Harness the wisdom and the power of God for daily success. And when you do fail, because you will, you're in the flesh, fail forward. Receive the grace of God and keep going strong. And if you will do that, the mediocre life that you're now living will fade and you will begin to shine with the glory of God because your life will reflect the goodness and the power and the wisdom of God. Amen? Father, I thank you and praise you for all of your goodness. And I ask you in Christ's name that you would come into our lives in a very special way that maybe our eyes would be open just now. Father, help us to see that the things we're chasing after are the byproducts of a greater pursuit. That if we'll lean into it and press into the great pursuit, if we aim at heaven, that earth will be thrown in. And when we fail, never to give up, but to fail forward knowing that one day we'll wake up and we will realize we have become the person that we always truly wanted to be. And we would have gained the things, eternal things, that we always wanted to gain. In Christ's name, amen. Congratulations on finishing another video here at the One and All YouTube channel. I'm so glad we got to experience that together and I'd love to experience another video with you. So why don't you pick this one right here, this video, or you can subscribe right here. And I'd love it if you were inspired by this video in any way, if you would take the time to hit the like button, comment, and even consider sharing this content with a friend because chances are if it inspired you, it's gonna inspire somebody you know. Let's continue on this journey together and watch another video.